you out of the here and now, uh, out of the what's going on in our world, and to get you to remember your faith, to get you to remember what it is we're supposed to do on a daily basis and how it is we're supposed to walk. That being said, I will certainly still make references, I'm sure, throughout the series to the pandemic and to how it impacts your life. But I also want you to know that I'll be glad to address any concerns you might be having during this pandemic. Because again, our lives have been altered substantially. So if you have a specific question or a specific concern that you would like me to address uh, in the midweek message, as I did this past week, calling for prayer for God's mercy, I'll be glad to do that. Just text me or email me your question. Uh, it's already been suggested to me that I addressed marriages during COVID-19 because you're spending a lot more time with each other. And of course, the stress level uh, economically, medically, there's a lot of people with anxieties, there's depression. So somebody has already said, hey, talk to us about marriage because marriages may be uh, on the rocks during this time. And so maybe I'll do that this week. But regardless, if you have a question, concern, something you'd like me to address biblically uh, to help you and or the congregation, please let me know, and I'll certainly consider doing that. What are we going to talk about this morning? Something that will require you to put your thinking caps on, something that will take a little more mental effort to grasp, something that will require you to separate right now all of the hoopla and drama taking place in our world. I'm going to ask you to get ready to understand an important Important biblical principle in the book of Galatians. So turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to talk about an important principle in the book of Galatians that will answer probably one of the most uh, difficult questions you have had in your faith. We'll introduce the principle today. I'll reiterate it uh, through three simple points, and then we will take it from there, and you'll understand in a moment. You say, what's that question? What's the question this may answer? The question is, Something to the effect of, why is it that when I intend to do right and I determine to do better, that I so easily and quickly fail to follow through on that? Perhaps you, if you've lived any length of life as a believer, you've been pretty frustrated to find out how hard it is to be spiritually successful, to be everything that you know God wants you to be. And this, this series is going to be for the believer, for the Christian. If you're an unbeliever this morning and you're tuning in, we are very glad to have you with us. Uh, when the church doors open up, please come and join us. We'd love to meet you, get to know you. Uh, in the meantime, I would uh, ask that you would go to our website at some point in the near future. On the top of our website, you'll see a button called Forgiveness. Go to that page, and there's a short five-minute video explaining what it means to be saved from your sin, to receive Christ as your Savior, and why you need to do that before it's eternally too late. That requires you becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. Then you become a Christian, you're in the faith, and you can have a little more understanding of what we're talking about this morning. But if the times in which we're living has, have taught us anything, it has taught us that we cannot boast ourselves of tomorrow, for we know not what a day may bring forth. Meaning, we can't make any plans for tomorrow that we know are going to happen. How many people planned on vacationing uh, spring break? A lot of people. And those vacations have been canceled. How many of you planned an Easter dinner with your family or your extended family? Uh, a lot of you, all of you. Uncle Nick has his hand raised back there. It's a little short hand because he's Italian, but it's up. I can see it. And uh, guess what? You're not going to have Easter uh, lunch or brunch probably like you planned. So much of our plans have been thwarted and uh, erased by something we cannot see. And the truth is, is you have plans for college. You have plans for marriage, you have plans for having children, you have plans for retirement, you have plans for everything. The reality is none of us are guaranteed another hour. And so you want to take your eternity very seriously. So I urge you to go watch that video and if you have any questions about what it means to be born again, what it means to be saved from your sin, what it means to get the gift of eternal life, how to know you're going to go to heaven. If you have any questions, please reach out to us, uh, Pastor Phil and myself. We will be glad to take the Bible and uh, give you some answers to those questions. But again, getting back to believers and uh, facing this frustration of not spiritually succeeding, it's a daily problem for any of us who have that desire. Think about how often you find yourself trying to do right. I'm going to do better today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be better today. And within moments, perhaps, within hours, you find yourself being humbled 
reminded that you're not as good as you thought or as good as you want to be. It's incredibly frustrating when we determine to do right and have every intention of doing right only to quickly and easily do the wrong thing. I think about the husband or wife. And marriage isn't easy. Some people think before they get married that it's easy. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. And so marriages have all kinds of ups and downs. And the husband gets up in the morning and realizes his wife's not happy with him. And he says, you know, I got to be a better husband. So I'm going to be a better husband. And today it's going to be different. We're going we're gonna to turn the page. We're going we're gonna to have a fresh start. And within minutes, she says something or, or does something that sets him off. And he says something or does something he shouldn't. And he's, he gets in the car to go to work and looks in the rearview mirror, sees himself and says, what's wrong with me? I had every intention to do right, and here I am. Maybe it's the coworker. You go to, you go to work, and you say, I've got to be a better testimony today. I, I can't lose it so quickly. I've got to be a good a coworker. I've got to be a little more submissive and kind to my boss, even though I don't like him or her, but I've got to be better. And so you go to work minded and prayerful to be better, to do better, to have a better attitude. And within minutes, somebody does something or says something that sets you off, and you go back to your machine or your desk and, and, and hang your head and think, man, what's wrong with me? Why can't I seem to make the changes that I need to make? But we're going to address why I believe we go through this cycle on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I believe Galatians is going to give you and, to, and give me the key to understanding why we keep getting so frustrated, and ultimately how to break that frustration and proceed to find some spiritual success in our lives. Now, before we read Galatians 5, we're going to read a little bit in Galatians 3. Before we read some in Galatians 3, I need to give you the context of the book of Galatians. If you're not familiar with Paul the Apostle writing letters in the New Testament, he's writing letters to new churches, early churches within Christianity. Christianity is not very old. It's really in its infancy. It's just getting going. It started in Jerusalem upon the death resurrection of Christ. The apostles then took that great commission, and they began to preach there in Jerusalem. Of course, uh, the day of Pentecost is when the church really gets going. Paul the apostle would eventually get saved. He then takes the gospel and, and goes into Asia and goes into places beyond Jerusalem, and he really takes the gospel to the world. Churches are established. One of those churches is in Galatia, which is in Turkey. And you have these early Christians who are converting to Christianity, and unfortunately, early in their faith, somebody introduces them the idea that it's not good enough just to believe in Christ and to become a Christian. You also have to keep some of what I believe is the Old Testament law. It seems like circumcision was a big problem for the Galatians. Uh, but there probably were some Jewish converts in that church, if not most of them. And these individuals, somebody said, hey, we still have to be circumcised. We still have to obey the Ten Commandments and all the laws in Judaism if we're going to be legit and accepted before God. So they began to take on this new gospel, the false gospel. As we know, Paul taught it elsewhere that salvation is by grace through faith alone, not of works, it's not of ourselves the gift of God. We no longer need the Old Testament law when we receive Christ. Christ got rid of the Old Testament law. The Galatians couldn't quite get beyond that. And I think this was a common problem, having been in the law for thousands of years, and they had to do, 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 do. Now you're told all you got to do is be like Christ, and that's good enough? Exactly. Accept Christ as your Savior and follow Christ, and that's the Christian path. Not necessarily an easy path, but that's the Christian path. Well, Paul has to address the Galatians. And he says to them in uh, chapter 1, don't turn there, verse number 6, he said to them, I marvel that ye are so soon re uh, removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He says, I can't believe it. You've forsaken the, the basis, the foundation of Christianity already. And he talks in the book of Galatians about circumcision. He say, why is circumcision such a big deal? you're not familiar with what circumcision is as far as biblically, it's a massive deal to the Jewish people. You say, why? Well, let's go back in time. Abraham was chosen by God to start a new people. And this would become the Israelites, the Jewish people. Abraham would have Isaac. Isaac would have Jacob. Jacob's name would be turned to Israel. Israel would have 12 tribes. And there you have the nation of Israel. 
when Abraham was given a promise after coming out of his land into a new land, God says, I'm going to give you and your descendants all of this land you can see as far as the north to the south, east, and west. That's why we refer to the land of Israel as the promised land. It was promised to Abraham. He was willing to leave his home and his family, and God said, I'm going to give you a new home with your new family. But it wasn't just a promise. It was a covenant, meaning there were some terms attached to it. And the term was, you and your family and all of your descendants needed to be circumcised. We're obviously just referring to males. On the eighth day, every Jewish boy would be circumcised. The circumcision, which is a physical thing, obviously, it was a physical mark of the covenant that God made with Abraham to give him all of this land. If you didn't get circumcised, you essentially were cut off from the land, cut off from the nation. So circumcision for every Jewish boy, from Abraham and Ishmael on through the present, they would get circumcised, and that was their connection. That was their proof that they had rights to the promised land. So you can imagine these new Jewish believers, they're not really sure what to do with circumcision. They still think it's a requirement of the law because of the covenant. And I want you to look now why, why he continues to deal with this in verse number 1 of chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 1. Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Verse 2, this only would I learn of you. This is what I want to know, he says. I want you to tell me. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He says, Galatians, tell me. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by working the law, by getting circumcised, by observing the Sabbath, by observing the dietary law, by doing all the things that are in the Ten Commandments and beyond? Is that how you got born again? Is that how you got saved from your sin? Is that how you became a child of God? Is that how you received the Holy Spirit? Or did you receive it by the hearing of faith? Meaning, we read in Romans chapter 10 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Christianity is based on the Word of God. And when you hear the gospel of Christ in the Word of God, that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried for you, rose again, On that third day, you need to accept him as your Savior. Why Jesus said, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how you become born again and how you receive the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, tell me, Galatians, did you get the Holy Spirit by believing in Christ, by the hearing of faith, or did you get it by doing things, by being good? The answer, obviously, is you got it by receiving Christ. The Spirit of God wasn't received in the Old Testament, by doing commandments. He goes on to say in verse 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? He says, you started in your faith by accepting Christ, and you got the Spirit by accepting Christ. How is it you're going to be made better than that, having the Spirit, by doing all these works? He says, guys, it makes no sense. Works aren't good enough to become a Christian. Works aren't good enough to make you a better Christian. He's trying to get them off off of the whole works thing. Well, he goes on in chapter 3. Again, we're not, not going to take time to look at it, but he goes on to bring in Abraham into the conversation. And he links Abraham to the covenant. And he talks about how Abraham's faith was more important than anything else. But then he talks, listen very carefully, then he talks about Abraham's two sons. They are Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael, if you know the Old Testament, Ishmael was a work of the flesh. Sarah and Abraham were impatient. They wanted the promised child that they had not yet received. And so Sarah says to Abraham, hey, Abraham, God's not going to give me a kid, so why don't you take Hagar, my servant, have a child with her, and we'll adopt that child, and that will be the promised child. Well, that's not what God intended. Abraham, by the work of the flesh, by his own behavior, made a child. His name was Ishmael. Well, the real child that God was going to give Abraham was Isaac. That was going to be a miracle child. Abraham would be 100. Sarah would be 90. It wasn't a work of the flesh. Yes, they participated because it takes two to make a child, but it was God's miracle. It was something beyond what the flesh can perform. It was a spiritual miracle to give them a physical child at that age. So you have Ishmael, the work of the flesh, and you have Isaac, which was the work of God. 
And the story that Paul tells the Galatians, which they should have known from the Old Testament, was this. Ishmael, when he got older and Isaac was born, Ishmael was 13 years old, and he was picking on Isaac. He was persecuting him was the word Paul used. And he was picking on him and, and mocking him. And what did, what did God tell Abraham to do with Ishmael? He said, send him away. Get rid of him. He is the son of your bond maiden. He is not the son of your wife. He is the son of the work of your flesh. He is not the son that I promised you through the miracle of God. And so send him away. You say, what's happening here? It's an allegory. It's a symbolic a lesson that Paul is teaching the Galatians. He is saying, Ishmael represents the Old Testament law. And Ishmael, the Old Testament law, mocks us. It persecutes us. It reminds us that we're sinners. When we read, thou shalt not covet, and we covet, we're reminded of how wicked we are and how sinful we are. And the law tells us we're bad. It persecutes us. It reminds us of, of the bad things about us. And God has said to us through Christ, through the bloodshed of Christ, I'm going to remove the law from you. You're no longer going to be under the law. I'm going to remind you that you're forgiven, that you don't have any sins. Move on from the law and live in grace. Ishmael represents the law. Isaac represents grace. Ishmael represents the Old Testament. Uh, Isaac re represents the New Testament. Ishmael represents the flesh, the work of the flesh. Isaac represents the spirit. And the whole teaching that Paul is giving him is move on from Ishmael. Move on from the law because God's removed it from us. Focus on Christ and the Spirit. It really is a fantastic teaching. I'm getting excited. Turn to chapter 5, and we'll get into the real meat of the message now. I hope you're staying with me. Thinking caps on, please. This is so important. You say, what does it have to do with COVID-19? Absolutely nothing. Because there's more to life than COVID-19. The vast majority of us, hopefully all of us, will not uh, lose our lives or perish at the hands of COVID-19. And so life will go on for us. We must be prepared to live our lives according to the pleasure of God. Here we go, chapter 5, verse number 1. Paul says then, in light of what I just shared with you, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage is the Old Testament law. I have to keep the commandments. I have to do right. I have to go to the, to the synagogue on Saturday. I have to get circumcised. I have to, have to, have to. That's a yoke of bondage. Verse 2, he says, I, Paul, a Hebrew man, says unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In other words, if you want to get circumcised and you think circumcision is the path to spiritual success, circumcision is the path to pleasing God and getting to heaven, then you've got to do all of it, man. Paul says if you're going to rely on that, then you have to rely on all of the law. And here's the problem. If you offended one point, you're guilty of all. That's what James spoke of. So God is freeing us from having to be perfect because we can't be. Verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. By that he means if you're relying on the law, if you think you're going to be justified by the law because you're such a good person, then you no longer have any opportunity to benefit from Christ because you're relying on the wrong thing. Christ is of no effect. So he's setting their doctrine straight, that they are no longer in uh, bondage to the law, Christ had, has freed them from that. But jump down to verse 13. Just because they're not subject to the Old Testament law, it doesn't mean they should go on and live carnal lives. Verse 13. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We're in church, so that sounds... Easy peasy, right? Is it always easy to buy love to serve one another? Well, it's easy to love and serve the people that love and serve you. But Paul says one another, meaning everybody. That's not easy because there are some people you don't really like. There's some people that don't like you. There's some people that don't serve you. There's some people that make your life difficult. That's not always easy. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, if you do this, you'll fulfill the whole law. 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, we're in church. That sounds great. That's easy to do. Well, leave church and have somebody curse you out. Leave church and have somebody cut you off on the road. Leave church and, in this day and age, have somebody cough in your face or sneeze in your face. There are a lot of things that can prompt you not to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So it should be our intention, Christian, to love one another. It should be our determination to love our neighbor as ourselves. It should be our daily goal to, by love, serve one another. That starts with your wife, your husband, your parents, your children, your siblings, your coworkers, your neighbors. Yeah, we don't always do that. In fact, even though we want to, we find ourselves struggling to care for the people in our lives. We find ourselves getting jealous that somebody gets a job. We find ourselves getting envious if somebody gets a raise. We find ourselves uh, struggling with seeing somebody that we don't particularly care for succeed. So why is it that we know we should love our neighbors ourselves? We know we should by love serve another, serve one another, but we struggle with that. How do we avoid feeling the way we do about the people in our lives? How do we avoid saying the things we say to the loved ones in our homes? How do we love one another on a consistent basis? The answer is in verse 16. It's an answer we overlook. It's religious jargon, but the truth of the next few verses could change the course of the rest of our lives if we embrace them. Verse 16, here we go. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Paul says the two are opposites. Understand this. The flesh and the spirit, uh, they are antonyms. They are antithesis of each other. They are opposites. The flesh is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is contrary to the flesh. What the flesh wants to do, the spirit won't allow, and what the spirit wants to do, the flesh won't allow. They are opposites. And Paul says if you want to do the right thing, You've got to walk in the Spirit, because if you walk in the Spirit, and because it's contrary to the flesh, the flesh cannot be fulfilled. Keep that in mind. Verse number 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. What he means is this. If you're led of the Holy Spirit, you don't need a law, because you're not going to do wrong. If you're led of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to need to be told to love one another. If you're led of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to need to be told, thou shalt not steal. If you're led of the Spirit, you're not going to need to be told, thou shalt not commit adultery, because the Spirit won't let the flesh fulfill the lust thereof. Hang with me, because this gets very easy to understand, maybe hard to implement. Verse number 19. Now, in light of the Spirit and the flesh being opposites and contrary one to another, he writes the works, that's an important word, the works of the flesh are manifest, they're revealed, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. You say, what's lasciviousness? Lasciviousness is indecency. It's the young man or young lady or it's the old guy or the old gal who goes around and they make gestures of indecency or do things uh, spontaneously, lustful things, perverted things. Verse 20, here's another work of the flesh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance. You say, what's variance? Uh, if you like to argue with people, you got to resist everything people say. That's variance. Emulations. You say, what are emulations? You emulating. You're always trying to be like somebody else. You're always trying to be like someone else. Why? To be better than them. The pride thing. Wrath, strife, sedition. Sedition is resisting authority. Uh, heresies, publicly resisting or denouncing Christian truths. Envyings, murders, drunkenness revelings or partying and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, in contrast to the works of the flesh, you have the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. No one's going to tell you you can't love somebody. No one's going to tell you you can't be good. No one's going to tell you you can't be temperate. No one's going to tell you you can't be peaceful or, or gentle. There's no law against that. You are, you are uh, free from all laws when you're led by the Spirit because it will produce these virtues. And you'll be free from the do's and don'ts. You'll be free from what you can and cannot do. The Spirit liberates you from the work of the flesh and the necessary law. Verse 24, and they that are Christ's, Christians, believers, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That means if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you realize the law is insufficient. The flesh cannot be good enough to please God and get his acceptance. And so we needed something beyond our flesh, something beyond the law. We needed the cross. We needed Christ. We needed a Savior. And when we accepted Christ, we essentially crucified our flesh, our lusts, our desires, saying they're not good, and they're not good enough for God. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, meaning if we're born again, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we're born again by the Holy Spirit of God, then let us walk, let us grow, let us appease and feed and give our lives over to the Holy Spirit because that will be the ultimate uh, solution, the key to being spiritually successful. This passage, I know it may require a little extra thought for you to get into it, but this passage will free you from a lifetime of frustration. It exposes the root problem and reveals the solution to living a spiritual, successful life. We're going to talk about that. Now, when you get back in church, you're going to come into the new sanctuary, and it really is beautiful. Uncle Nick, real quick, can you show them camera number, whatever that is up here on the platform? They can see it from this direction. They can see the paying attentive uh, pastor's families and Mrs. Harmon over here, Mr. Harmon. Got to make sure they're staying awake. Are we awake over there? Gotcha, Bella, huh? You weren't awake. Uh, the sanctuary is beautiful. It's coming together very well. When you get here, you're going to see signs on the walls. And there are nine fruits of the Spirit that are on the walls of the new sanctuary. And so these hopefully will remind you of the series and help you in the rest of your life to focus on what is important in your Christian life, to avoid being frustrated. Uh, we should all want to be spiritually successful, shouldn't we? Husbands, you should wake up and want to be spiritually successful for the sake of your wife. Wives should want to do the same thing for their husbands. Parents should want to do the same thing for their children. Kids should want to do that for their parents. We should want to be spiritually successful as brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, etc. If you're going to be spiritually successful, understand three things, and I hope to give them to you very quickly because I know what time it is, and I'll be repetitive in these points. So I hope you get the... Uh, the point of what the principle is. But number one, spiritual success is not the fight of the flesh. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, what I mean by this is we get up, and we don't know we do this, but we get up in the morning, or we come to church and we hear a message, and we say to ourselves, you know what? I'm going to be better today. I'm going to do better today. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more gentle. I'm going to be more gracious. I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to be righteous. And what we are telling ourselves is, we're going to do this. The flesh cannot produce virtue. It's impossible. Because as Paul said, I know that in my flesh, in me, dwelleth no good thing. What did he just say? The works of the flesh are, he listed all bad things, didn't he? evil things. It's impossible for the flesh to produce virtue. It's no more possible for the flesh to fly. If you want to fly, your body can't do it. You need a plane to take you up in the air and to keep you up in the air. So it is with virtue. If you want virtue, you need something else to give you virtue and to, and to preserve that virtue. That's the Holy Spirit. We try to produce virtue in the flesh and that's why we get so frustrated so quickly, because it's not possible. It's just not possible. As I've said uh, in the introduction, Galatians is a book of contrast. He's trying to get these new believers to go from Old Covenant to New Covenant, Old Testament to New Testament. He's trying to get them to go from works uh, to faith. He's trying to get them from flesh 
to spirit. He's trying to get them through allegory from Ishmael to Isaac, from Sinai to Jerusalem, uh, from the son of a bond maiden to the son of a, a, a wife. He's trying to get them to go beyond yesterday. Understand fundamentally in your Christian life, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your mind, your, your human nature is so different, so opposite from the spirit. It's like north and south, cold and hot, east and west, up and down. I mean, it's so opposite. They are true antonyms. And if we're going to produce virtue, it will require far more than mere determination and good daily intentions. We have to realize that virtue and spiritual success in our life will not come from this. It must come from the Holy Spirit. And what we try to do is not our job to do. It's the fruit of the Spirit that we cannot create. We cannot duplicate it. Think about the seventh commandment in the Old Testament. The idea, the, the principle rather, that we should not commit adultery. That's an act of the flesh. You can obey the seventh commandment by locking yourself in a room and making sure you never get out so that you don't commit adultery with a married woman. But while you're still in that room, you can be thinking about adul adultery. You can be lusting in your heart in that room. Circumcision doesn't make you any more holy than anyone else. Keeping the commandments doesn't produce virtue because we still have the problem with the flesh. We still have the problem. The Spirit, however, when we focus on the Holy Ghost within us, it will produce virtue no matter where we are, no matter who we're with, and no matter what we're doing. And so if you want to experience goodness in your life, the focus should not be on what I'm going to do or how hard I'm going to try. It should be focusing on the Holy Spirit of God. I hope that makes sense, makes sense to you. Uh, number two, spiritual success is not the product of the law. It is the produce of the Spirit. Just because a Jewish man got circumcised doesn't make that man holy. Just because a Jewish man observed the Sabbath doesn't mean that man was pure. Now, I think we struggle with this general principle, and we have a lot of frustrations within Christianity, in particular conservative Christianity, because we have in many ways, been guilty of the same thing the Galatians were guilty of. We've created Christian laws. Pastors have done it. Preachers have done it. Parents definitely do it. But we basically create laws that have to be followed. Preachers will tell you, you have to come to church. You have to come to church. And if you don't come to church, we're going to make you feel bad. I do it. I text you. Where were you? It's an unwritten law. You better show up to church or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you by the law. We don't even know we do it, but we put out this concept that you have to be in church. And so what happens is you come to church and you think, oh, good, I'm coming to church, so I'm good. Listen, coming to church doesn't produce virtue in you. You can come to church for a year in every service and be just as vile as you were when you came in because you can sit there and be full of pride, be full of bitterness. We can tell you what haircut you have to have. Well, a guy can have the, the right haircut but still be as carnal as I'll get out. We tell you, ladies, what clothes you should wear to be modest, and, and you can do that. You can go out and get the right wardrobe that, that fits the preacher's criteria, the Christian law, but you can be full of bitterness and wear the right thing. Law doesn't produce virtue. The Holy Spirit does. Think about laws. They give us parameters to avoid doing bad. They simply keep us out of trouble. They don't produce goodness. Can I give you an illustration, one that will help you realize I'm as carnal as the next? We were in Arizona. Uh, about a month ago now, maybe a little more than that, and uh, we had traveled the state to see everything. It was the goal to get mom up to Grand Canyon, and we started in the southern part of the state and made our way to the northern part of the state. Understand, if you go to Arizona and you think it's a desert and it's flat and it's easy driving and boring driving, you will be disappointed. You have to pay attention, and if you're afraid of heights, uh, you're going to be probably losing a few years of your life in stress. Well, we start in the southern part of Arizona, and everything's windy and curvy and hilly and mountainous, and it's beautiful, by the way. But we go up to northern Arizona, where it's scary and frightening because of the cliffs, hence the Grand Canyon, and we see some really cool stuff, and we're going to make a drive, about a two-and-a-half-hour drive in the darkness, and it's dark up there, to our hotel near the Grand Canyon. Well, we find out that Google takes you through the park. Say, what's the big deal at the park? Well, the park, it's pitch black. There's no lights in the park. 
And we went at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, whatever it was, it was pitch black. Here's the bigger problem for a guy like me. It's a 35 mile per hour speed limit for, for miles and miles. That's like purgatory for me. If you know me, I don't like to drive slow. I got a place to be, place to go. And so I like to get there. Well, 35 miles per hour. And we realized about halfway through the park that we were driving along the cliffs of the Grand Canyon. Now you throw in heights. I'm terrified of heights. It's pitch black, 35 miles per hour. So I'm, I'm stressed. I'm anxious, but I'm behaving. Because I had my wife in the back seat who was reminding me to behave. My mother was behaving in the front seat. She wasn't telling me to slow down. So anyways, I'm behaving, legit. I'm on the brakes half the time because you're going down hills. And for a good hour, I obeyed the law. I worked hard to obey the law. And I finally see on my Google Maps the home stretch. We got a couple miles to go. There's the hotel. We're leaving the, ca the canyon cliffs. We're going to get to a place where I can rest my eyes. I was exhausted. I was stressed out. And I let the car coast. I did not accelerate. As God is my witness, I let it coast. I just wasn't going to ride the brakes on the home stretch. You guessed it. Superhero park ranger who wants to get the promotion is going to pull me over in the Grand Canyon and try to give me a speeding ticket for going 55 and a 35. Nobody's around. The, 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 the animals were sleeping. The people were gone. I've got my mother in my front seat. I'm in a minivan. My kids and my wife are in the back seat. And Superstar Park Ranger, she walks up and, you know how fast you were going. Like, I was ready to be as unchristian as I've ever been. I was ready in, in the presence of my entire family. If she dared give me a ticket, I was going to let her know about what I thought about a park ranger playing policeman. You're here to keep the animals safe. You're here to keep people from starting forest fires. You're not here to pull over dudes who are driving their mom, their wife, and their kids in a minivan who spent the last hour driving 35 miles per hour and, and for a second let his foot off the brake. You are not going to give me a ticket, lady. Now, fortunately, he didn't give me a ticket. That saved my testimony. What's the point? I obeyed the law. Did it make me any better? No. In fact, I lost all virtue. I had the work of the flesh. It's called sedition. I was ready to rise up against government agencies right there and then. I, I did not care what she was going to do to me. That's the work of the flesh. And obeying the law doesn't make me any better. Obeying the law merely keeps me out of trouble. So laws do not produce righteousness. Uh, let's make it very practical for you guys. And maybe ladies. But if you're married... There's an unwritten law in your homes you're to follow. And, I, and, and those laws can get very, very intricate. There can be hundreds of them. It may be thou shalt not leave the toilet seat up. It may be thou shalt not come to dinner late. It may be thou shalt not walk away from me when we're talking. But there's lots of laws. And a lot of husbands, I think, more so than wives, they try to adhere to the law of their wife. and They think that will make them a better husband. The reality is, Abiding by laws, they don't produce virtue. You're still the same guy. Happy wife, happy life only works for a little bit. You know what a happy wife will be? When she has a virtuous husband, a husband who is gentle, a husband who is loving. And you know what? When a husband or a wife has those virtues, if you're led by the Spirit, you're no longer under the law. You don't need laws. You don't need your spouse to tell you what they want you to do or what they expect of you. Because you're already doing it. There's no law against loving. There's no law against all those things. That's why this passage is so beautiful, so beautiful. We keep laws uh, in America or even in the Christian church or in Judaism, but we gripe about them, and we try, find, try to find ways around them. They don't produce anything good in us. Doing what your parents want you to do, young people, doesn't make you a better kid. Adhering and complying to the laws of your parents, whether it's thou shalt go to bed at this time, or thou shalt not be on your phone at this time, or thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, that just makes you a compliant kid. You can do that and then leave the house and be no better. So following a law, being determined in the flesh to do right, you'll find yourself very frustrated. Being full of the Spirit, though, walking in the Spirit, it produces the virtue of, on its own. That's the beauty of this passage. And then number three, again, just to reiterate what we're talking about, 
spiritual success is not the will of self. It is the way of the Spirit. I wonder how many times have you been saved for any length of time and do you have any desire to serve God that you've looked in the mirror and uh, with disgust had a conversation with yourself? You looked at yourself and after years and years of trying to be better and do better, you just look at yourself and say, what's, what's wrong with you? Why can't you change? Why won't you be different? Why do you always revert back to that thing? That way. Why is it you always come back to the same thing? And then you say, I'm going to be different this time. I'm sick of it. I'm going to do whatever it takes. You're missing, you're missing the obvious. It doesn't matter how hard you try, how much you want it, how determined you may be. You are who you are. If you're a negative person, you're going to be negative. That's your DNA. If you have a problem with lust, who you are. That's your DNA. If you gravitate towards money, who you are. But you're always going to gravitate towards. You can't stop it. You can't change it because you are who you are by birth, by conception even, but by birth, by life. We are who we are. That's why a guy will get together with a girl and all of his buddies will say, man, you're changing. You're, you're doing what she wants you to do. And, and she is. She's, she's able to change him for a while, but as soon as she breaks up with him, what does he do? Instantly returns to who he was. Same thing with, with our spiritual lives. We change because pastor says we got to. We change because my wife says I've got to. But as soon as we get a little break from that, we go right back to where we were. Because we are who we are. doesn't matter how bad you want to be different. The only way to be better, the only way to get virtue is to welcome in the one thing, the one person that naturally produces virtue. And that's the Holy Spirit. The whole point is, is if you wake up and you say, well, I'm going to be better today, you've made a mistake already because you said, I'm going to be better. If you want to be different, if you want to have virtue, finally, once and for all, you have to wake up and say, I cannot matter today. Today, the Holy Spirit must matter. Today, I can't be better. Today, he, the Holy Spirit, must be bigger. You're going to hear me say this over and over through our study. And if there's anything I want you to remember throughout the course of the next 10 lessons is this simple statement. If you want to evidence the fruit, then you need to emphasize the root. If you want to have the fruit of the Spirit, all these things you'll see on the walls of this sanctuary, then you have to emphasize in your life the root that produces those fruits. And the root is not the flesh. The root is not the law. The root is not the will of the, of the person. The, the root of the fruit is the Holy Spirit. We talk so little about the Holy Spirit. We emphasize the Holy Spirit so little. And that is precisely why we get so frustrated. And so if you want to evidence virtue today, get the focus off of the person in the mirror and get the focus on the Holy Spirit of God. You know, doing good things doesn't produce virtue. Doing good things is good, but it doesn't produce virtue. What produces virtue is letting the Holy Spirit have full control in your life. That's why Paul says, if you live in him, walk in him. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. You say, how do I do that, Pastor? Well, that is perhaps the harder thing because it requires a complete denial of self. And the way to walk in the Spirit is you have to feed the Holy Spirit, meaning do all those things that give Him the attention, that give Him the control in your life. Do those things that, that maximizes the Holy Spirit and minimizes the flesh, that increase the Holy Spirit and decrease the flesh. You say, what are those things? Well, absolutely, read the Word of God. Now, just doing that is not going to do anything for the Holy Spirit, but reading the Word of God and immersing yourself in what the Holy Spirit's ministry is, ministry of the Word, will help feed the Spirit. Listen to spiritual songs. Sing and make melody in your heart spiritual music because if you read Ephesians chapter 5, that's what helps you be filled with the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Listen to the still, small voice of God. When you hear, shouldn't have done that. When you hear, 
Wolverines talk to her. When you hear, go and do this. That's the Holy Spirit. You can't quench him. You have to feed him. You have to hearken to him. That will start to give you the ability to walk in the Spirit. Paul said it. Look at it one more time. We're just about done. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. I mean, this is the formula for avoiding frustration and being successful. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's all about the Holy Spirit. Everything about us being victorious and successful is about the Holy Spirit. Time to focus on Him. Time to give up on us. Leave the frustration behind. And let Him produce fruit. The Spirit is the root. And the fruit comes from Him. It doesn't come from us, no matter how hard we try. So I close by again reminding you, if you want to evidence the fruit, in your life you must emphasize Let's bow our heads there at home, close our eyes.